takes just a second. So thank you everyone for your patience. Let's make sure the controls work here. Don't mind me. No worries at all. Alrighty, everyone. Thank you so very much for coming and uh, to the last session or latest session of Game RT's Learn and Play series. I'm Danielle Costello. I'm a research and instruction librarian for Louisiana State University, where I teach library instruction, develop programming for the student body. I'm also the Game RT uh, current uh, events programming co-chair, and in particular today, co-host of our Learn and Play. With me, we have Thomas Foss, past president. Thomas, if you could please introduce yourself as well. Oh, hello there, everybody. I'm Thomas Post. I'm director at the Ruth M. Lowe Library of Garrett County out here in Western Maryland. And yes, press president of the Games and Gaming Roundtable and a trivia aficionado. Excellent. This event is being recorded. The recording will be available to GameRT members for six months before becoming publicly available on the GameRT website. We're also live streaming the session on Twitch. Hello, everyone on Twitch. The Twitch on video on demand will also be accessible after six month member only period. If you aren't already following us on Twitch, do so so you can see all the shenanigans we're building on the channel, all the good resources we are sharing. And for those of you who are not familiar with GamesRT, we are the Games and Gaming Roundtable of the American Library Association. Our mission is to promote gaming and libraries, whether that's programming, collection development, community building, prototyping, playtesting, or research. We've got you covered, and we're so excited to have everyone here today. We have yeah, we do lots of stuff. There, oh, there you go, Thomas. <laughs> and thank you for showing the slide because we wanted to show all the things we have upcoming. It is a full slate. So in February, uh, the second Friday, we're going to start with a low stress, high mayhem. It's our session of live play for a micro TPT RPG. And then we're going to have a webinar by our current president, Rebecca Strang, on TTRPG for kids. So if you want to bring children into the library and be playing TTRPGs, Please, please, please come to that session. It'll be February 28th. Links and registration for that will be available soon. And I'll be posting all the links for how you can access these events very soon in the chat. We also have a Games On grant. So if you're looking to do games in your library, you're looking into bringing more of that to your community, check out the Games Grant. We uh, do fund 500 or, or to $250. Uh, grants for libraries in need. And finally, our most exciting and newest adventure is a mini conference. So in March, we will be doing tabletop RPGs as our theme. And you, uh, we have sessions, five minutes, 15 or 30 minute sessions that we're making a call for presenters, whatever theme, uh, whatever kind of area, whether that's collection development, uh, cataloging, programming that you have an idea for, please share with us and come and join us for that fantastic session. As you can so, tell, we do all the cool stuff here at the Games Gaming Roundtable, and you should totally be a part of it. We are the very, very fancy roundtable, so very excited. Also, if you want to volunteer, links for how to do all those shenanigans will be soon um, added to the chat. So let's get on today's uh, presentation. There will be Q&A at the end of the session, and after that, we will be doing our trivia shenanigans. So please put any questions you have in chat. I will be looking both in the Zoom and Twitch chat, so don't worry about that. And uh, let's get started. So, what's trivia? <laughs> well, we thought, we thought we'd give a little bit of background about it, because what's better than trivia about trivia? Of course, trivia was is Latin. It's a Latin term for, um, and it, it's tied into the way uh, education used to take place during the Middle Ages. They had a thing called the trivium. There were three branches of it. Reading, sorry, not that, rhetoric, logic, and grammar. And those were the underpinnings of all education back in the Middle Ages. Now, of course, you know, logic, not so much used, and, you know, rhetoric, not so much used, and we've seen the consequences to that. So, um, so trivia came up, uh, as things changed, the word trivia became associated with useless knowledge, and so um, that's where it kind of is today, um, which is sad, I think, but don't get me started. But there's lots of uh, material that I would argue anyway could be considered trivia. If you go back to old Herodotus, I don't know if any of you have read Herodotus' histories. This is a guy who was basically fascinated by all the different cultures around him. And he was maybe a little too credulous for his own good sometimes. But uh, he liked to gather information all over the world and all over different cultures. And so, you know, I would make the argument that his was maybe one of the first uh, trivia works. And then uh, Diderot's Encyclopedia, of course, you know, it wasn't viewed as useless knowledge, but uh, back in the day, they were trying to collate all knowledge, including the useless stuff. And so, you know, you could make the argument that the, the old encyclopedia of the French Revolutionary period could be a trivia work. 
But of course, you know, trivia is people at a bar a lot of the time asking questions and saying, hey, you don't know the answer to that, do you? Pub bets have, you know, trivia's come up a long way through pub bets. We have a guy named Logan Pearsall Smith I tossed in here. He was um, a, a uh, essayist and author, and his works are not all that interesting, but he did write a book called Trivia, which was um, a bunch of random musings kind of that uh, you can flip through if you want. There's a whole link to it right there. Um, it is available online because it is out of copyright. But, you know, he might have helped popularize the term trivia. But of course, you know, you start talking trivia, you get into Ripley's Believed or Not. Robert L. Ripley's works originally focused on sports trivia. And then he branched out into much more interesting things as far as I'm concerned. But um, his, his uh, article still runs today. Uh, you know, he's long dead, of course, but the Ripley's Believed or Not is still made. And uh, you can see it every day online. I do. Then, of course, there's the Guinness Book World of Records, which came about because of basically a bar bet. It was actually a hunting bet, but uh, they were trying to figure out exactly. There, there's a bunch of rich, snobby British types who were hanging around at a hunt one day. And one of them asked, you know, who's the fastest bird out there? And so they none of them could agree. So they got a bet together and eventually, you know, they figured, you know, it'd be nice to know what all the superlatives are out there. The tallest, the highest, the fastest, the best. And so they wound up making a book about it. And then, of course, there's quiz shows. And there's a lot of those. Um, so Dr. IQ is arguably the first quiz show to place on the radio. And then they had the CBS television quiz, which came shortly after that, the first one on TV. And you can't see it anymore because they taped over all of them. Uh, lost media is a very, very interesting subject to study. Um, because, of course, they didn't care about preservation back then. So a lot of the time they just tape over old stuff. And so we don't have it anymore. So that's one of them. And then there's Take It or Leave It, which was another uh, interesting radio show that took place back in the day. But then you get into 21. How many of you saw the movie Quiz Show? It's a little old now. And that one, um, yeah, there you go. That one is about a big scandal that took place around these televised quiz shows in which, you know, photogenic people were being fed the answers to create maximum drama. Because, you know, we've got to have, you know, um, legitimacy in our reality TV, don't we? If, we? if people knew that it was all staged, no one would believe it, right? So, um, but 21 took place up until 1958. And that's when the scandal hit and pretty much killed off quiz shows for several years. Until you had Jeopardy roll around in 64. And that's, of course, been going strong ever since. And, you know, we librarians uh, distinguish ourselves constantly on Jeopardy because it's what we do. And then, of course, there's, you know, who wants to be a millionaire and all the. There's a ton of international variants to who wants to be a millionaire. That's uh, an interesting thing to see. Now, another thing that uh, a lot of people might not know about, I sure didn't, was there's an entire company that started in 1976 called Burns and Porter, and they were uh, developed to help uh, facilitate trivia in pubs in Britain. And so they are, are one of the ones that kickstarted the pub, uh, the pub trivia format. And then finally, you know, of course, you know, not finally, but another key one, of course, is Trivial Pursuit. And there's an interesting bit of trivia about Trivial Pursuit. They got sued early on because they were stealing questions from other reference books. And uh, they took that in this. So there's a little bit of an uh, overview of history. And uh, we'll go on to types. So now that we've gone over a little bit of the history of it, there are a variety of trivia kind of formats that work very very well and can be adapted either for inspirational or just straight up taken and played within your uh, library systems. Thomas mentioned game shows earlier. Jeopardy works very well within a library setting and setting up a Jeopardy like trivia event is very good and my students have enjoyed that very well. Um, there's also Wheel of Fortune, Price is Right. Those games are very adaptable to the library setting. We also have a variety of board games. So if you don't necessarily want to make the trivia and set up those kinds of uh, sessions, you can just bring out games like Trivial Pursuit, Cranium, Wits and Wagers, 
uh, Linky, there's a variety and we've linked those in the resource documents that work for a trivia like board game night. There's also virtual form factors like Jackbox and Cahoots or mobile games like uh, Trivia Crack or Quiz Up that are fantastic resources to explore and share with your uh, patrons as well. And you can even just have as simple as a question of the day up where people can look and see a trivia fact that they can learn or workbooks and worksheets that they can take home and play. Um, and then, of course, the more competitive and delightful variant of trivia, which is quiz bowls and kind of the one we're talking about specifically today, uh, pub style trivia, which is a little easier to format for the library and the style that we're going to share with you um, later in the session. But yeah, trivia is great for libraries for a lot of great reasons. Uh, to start, it's incredibly flexible. So with length, content, difficulty, form, all of these are moldable to whatever local kind of community interest you have, what people enjoy playing, what your library and staff would like to do, because sometimes it is difficult to come up with a lot of questions. Like I said, you can have a trivia game style night, or you can just take straight from um, a pub style trivia, they're, um, the questions that you see being played locally and just kind of modify that a little bit to your audience. Uh, it's not very expensive at all. Like it, if you have a projector, if you have a, um, which most uh, libraries do have projectors and the tech equipment, it is low cost. It's as much as creating a slide deck and then putting it online either virtually or um, within a, um, uh, a screen. And I don't even use a slide deck in mine, so. There you go. It is easily replicable. Once you figure out the first format that you wanna have, keeping those slides or not slides as well, you can reproduce easily once you get it down the first time. So that way you can have a regular night with your uh, uh, patrons and community. It also um, helps you reach a lot of different audiences because trivia is one of those things that I know a little something about that. That's not too bad versus say a Catan night or a uh, maybe a miniatures or TTRPG where people could be slightly intimidated. It's like, well, I don't, I don't know so much about that. And I don't want to be embarrassed. Trivia is kind of everybody knows a little bit of something, has seen a game show at least once, and can generally be able to bring their friends and have a good night of it. And that's something you should take in mind when you start making questions, but of course we'll get to that in a little bit too. And you have a more, uh, Thomas, on strengths? Oh, and other yes, things? absolutely. Yeah. Because um, one thing too is the trivia plays to our strengths. You know, we are librarians, it's what we do. We look things up, you know, and in looking things up, we learn a lot of things, don't we? And so, um, librarians uh, have always been very good at trivia and so that's it's something that's fun to be able to take to other people and get them uh, involved and interested too plus it helps reach new audiences now I do trivia nights during the winter it's a cold winters here in Garrett County but um, we uh, during the winter I go to a local pub and I do trivia outreach there and um, that helps me reach entirely new audiences of people and talk to them about hey what the library is doing I do book tie-ins which I'll get to in a bit and uh, ultimately doing trivia helps fulfill our mission to uh, um, yeah, for lifelong literacy lifelong learning um, it helps foster this intellectual curiosity that we all like to pride ourselves in in this profession. So there's a lot of ways to do it, how to do it. Yeah, so the way we are gonna showcase today is pub style trivia. This is generally team-based or not. You can have a team of one if somebody prefers to be left alone, but generally it fosters being able to be, you know, kind of make um, on the fly teams as well as bring in a group of friends. So it fits a lot of different uh, patrons being able to come in. You so have several, I, oh, go ahead, Thomas. Say, so the way I do it is we have, at the pub, we do, you know, people are uh, group up in whatever way they want, but sometimes that does cause problems because you'll have one giant group with a whole bunch of people there to slaughter everybody else. And so that's not always fair. One thing that I thought of was, or not, it was actually suggested to me as, a, as an idea for that would be take the cumulative number of points and divide by the number of players in the team. Ooh. I do like that a lot. So. Uh, we, for um, us, we've uh, made groups of five. So if you're in a group of five that comes in by um, as a uh, friend group, that's perfect. If you're not in a group of five, we're going to clump you together. 
and find you a group that will be um, that kind of is how we've alleviated that problem. Although one consideration, definitely think about how to form those teams. Uh, next part about prep trivia is you have several rounds that can be anywhere from seven to 10, depending on how much time and effort you want to go into it and how much kind of attention you feel your audience will have for it. Each I round, that's seven questions. Oh, yeah. There you go. And each round will have a variety of um, questions within that round. Scores are totaled generally at the end of each round. This gives your team of um, uh, uh, facilitators a chance to be able to score things and also gives people a chance to take a break while your facilitators are scoring. And then overall, a uh, winner gets is the one with the most points and they get, if you have a prize, the prize or just the glory of winning trivia. Uh, it's definitely a good idea to have bonus rounds because some people sometimes come in a little late. So if you have an early bonus round, that's just visual. That way you can definitely get all the stragglers together and not have to be like, well, sorry, you're just going to have to start wherever we're started. Uh, breaks and pauses are really important. One for scoring, but two, these are longer form events. And sometimes it's nice to be able to get up, stretch, kind of take a break, brain break, that kind of thing. Um, and tiebreakers are very important because people get very, very excited about their trivia and about being the potential winner. So if you have eventually those two teams that are going at it that have done very, very well, you're going to have at least a couple questions in the back to let them, you know, to get out at the very end. There's also win variations. So you don't have to just have an overall winner. You can have a round uh, halfway winner. You can have a each round winner. So you don't have to do several rounds cumulatively. It could be round one, round two, round three, and a winner of each round, which allows people to come and go for an event as well. And it's important to think um, rules vary a little bit, depends on what your library wants and needs. Uh, we have rules where no cell phones out, which we enforce by just kind of wandering around, but it's hard sometimes to figure out enforceability of uh, kind of, we, we were like, everybody, this is an event for fun. You don't have to take it very seriously. So what I do with that is, you know, I'll do up front um, something along the lines of, uh, so, you know, the rules up front, obviously no cell phones. If we see you using a cell phone, look things up. We all get to throw things at you. But that also gets everybody um, else in the room invested in enforcing that rule, too. There's a reason for that. Um, and the other thing it's also nice to be able to point out when you're in a room like this is if you know the answer, don't say it out loud because people next to you will not, you know, will they have ears, they will hear it. It will not help you. So. It does help. I had, did have one um, audio round where we were playing in Kanto and the students could not help themselves. Yeah. The entire group just screamed out the answer. And sometimes it does feel good that everybody's like, okay, okay, we're going to have this, this one. But in general, yes. Yeah. Close lips. So when you want to make good trivia questions, well, let's see. Uh, it, it gets hard. It, first off, making trivia questions takes time, and that's that's something that has to be mentioned. You know, these are low cost programs, but they do take up a fair bit of time when you're putting them together. Um, you know, ultimately, if you want to steal questions off the internet, then you know I'm not going to judge you. Certainly, it's for a you know good cause and all that. But um, you know, if you're going to be crafting up questions that um, you know are themed along a certain line, then yeah, in, in, um, it does take time. So you need to think about what format you're doing and um, who the audience is, especially. So if you're in a pub, you know, you're with a bunch of adults, you can get away with a bit more and you can be a bit more informal. If you're in a group of professional librarians, then, you know, you have maybe higher expectations of what folks uh, know and can uh, handle when it comes to trivia. It took me a while to really dial in exactly what is not too hard and what is not too easy. If it's too easy, it's boring. If it's too hard, it's frustrating. And it takes a bit to get there. Um, and so uh, um, guessability helps a lot. That's something really worth mentioning. You, you try to build in, um, if it's a particularly tough question, you try to build in a little hint, you know, um, like um, uh, what, um, Archer in Green, you know, was a popular uh, folk hero in the medieval period and stuff. You know, that one's obviously way too easy, but you get the idea. You know, it helps get another, you know, approach into the question. Regionality works real well for me. Um, I do questions all the time on local history. You know, what is the largest fish in Deep Creek Lake? And so that one, um, uh, actually several people got that, so I was happy. 
Um, and then uh, you want to talk about the 70-30 split? Sure. Um, so if you're trying to figure out this balance, a good split to start off with and then to tweak it as you kind of get your knowledge base of your uh, local patrons is to do 70 percent things that are very general, like Robin Hood questions, questions that are in the common kind of literature vein of things we know that have been read in our curriculums or general kind of local history questions. But then the 30% is where we get a little fun. That is expert level knowledge. That is somebody who is very interested in Broadway or very interested in sports is going to feel very good about getting that very specific question. So for our board game folks, maybe a general 70% uh, side of things is name a classic uh, movement token for Monopoly. And you can just let them guess any of the uh, classic eight. So that might be like a little thimble or the doggy. You know, those those are kinds of something that somebody with, would generally know. But then a so special interest question might be, what was the game of Monopoly derived from? Thomas might know this one. The landlord's game. Exactly. And so people who go into that category. Like, all the virtues of socialism. Yes, which is actually pretty funny uh, if we think about it. But so and in general, that can be how you format all of your questions for a round, but also how you format kind of the general, um, uh, the whole experience, 70% general knowledge, 30% very specific knowledge. And so that way people feel pretty good. My, I like to kind of skew that a little closer to 80-20 for students because my weird library knowledge is not the same as everybody, every student I come across. So definitely do that with a grain of salt, but that's a way of helping you kind of understand that and getting that feedback, evaluating at the end, seeing how your patrons and community like your questions or what questions totally bomb or for what reasons they bomb. So I did a Broadway round of things I thought were classic Broadway, but my students have never even heard of. However, I updated that to Broadway within the last five years and that round did very, very well. So once again, depends on audience, depends on what their yeah. interests are going to be. And it's hard to get away from yourself sometimes, isn't it? Because stuff that you think is just absurdly easy, some people, you know, because you like the subject, you know, some people might not have heard of. And so, um, again, audience matters. And one other thing worth mentioning, too, that I, won't, I forgot to get to that's very important, actually, is when you're talking about audience matters, that also informs the subject matter of your questions and the and the questions you choose because some questions can be offensive some questions can you know be you know downright unpleasant and so you really want to think about inclusivity when you're when you're crafting these questions this is something that's going to make somebody uncomfortable you, you, you want to avoid that um you know you, you can get away with a quite you can probably i did a category on poop once that went over very well because it's funny poop's funny but uh, I'm not going to do a category on greatest genocides. You know, it's it's you got you really got to pick what you're going to do and make it so that it is something that's fun, educational, and you know, ultimately kind of lighthearted. There were a couple other bits here. Um, get feedback. One thing I do at the end of every session is um, I say, "Hey, if you want, if you have any categories you want me to do next time, come on over. Let me know. I'll see what if I can build them in." And so I do take requests a fair bit, and um, that seems to get uh, people coming back quite a lot. And so that that works pretty well. And then tie-ins. I also at the pub, you know, this is supposed to be a library event. I'm not there to make money for the pub. I'm there to you know, promote library materials. So um, I bring a book that ties into every category and uh, show it off and do a little mini book talk about it. Um, and you know, hopefully get, generate a little interest in our uh, programs and materials, so. And you don't have to tie in just to your library, but it can be also other resources that you offer. So I'm doing a trivia event this afternoon that ties into student wellness and student wellness contacted us, wanted to do a collab. And so they're teaching financial literacy um, and we're getting a chance to showcase um, a fun trivia event and program for our uh, patrons of the library. So it's sometimes nice to not just tie into your library, but tie into other community resources as well and continue to build your collaborations and your community that way. There's lots and lots of types of rounds that you can try. Obviously, so there's, I'm sorry. There's, of course, single answer, the visual rounds, uh, theming rounds with music as well. Yeah, um, and uh, so music is a lot of fun. You go a lot of directions with that, but you got to make sure that you have access to a pretty good sound system because, you know, they will talk over it and they will talk over it. 
uh, themed questions. Uh, we'll get to some of those when we do our trivia here at the end. And, and sometimes if you're worried about kind of how difficult, how easy, you can just say a list of things. Because sometimes a single answer is hard versus, oh, I know some of the friends from friends, not all of them. So you can allow them to have three out of seven or four, or like how we have um, for our round, we will be asking for four of um, particular groups of people. So it gives people a little bit more of a chance to be able to get it, even if they don't quite know everything. And then on that four, sometimes it's nice to do kind of a question that uh, gets uh, more and more specific. So it starts with a general piece of information and then maybe an image and then a more specific piece of information and then a very, very specific piece of information. Zoom in, yeah. Yeah. That's a really cool idea. Um, one time in uh, for April Fool's Day, I did a trivia contest and uh, we I did a round on riddles instead of uh, actual trivia. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, gave a little bit of a, a twist. And so I think people enjoyed that one. And of course, you can do the same thing about jokes if you really want to um, see if they can get the answers. Yeah, Not really re trivia, but still fun. Yeah. And, and sometimes while trivia, you, you know, you feel like it's question and answer, you can move beyond that. And it's a lot of fun for your patrons to be able to experience a variety of potpourri of uh, different kinds of themes and not just content wise themes, but format wise and enjoy that experience as well. Lots of considerations. Yes. Want to start us out, Thomas? Oh, sure. Well, um, how are you weighting it? Are you weighting it? It's just going to be straight up, you know, one point, two point, this sort of thing. Um, you know, I'll change things on the fly sometimes. And, you know, even if the if somebody in the audience says, hey, can we get a bonus point if we know X? And maybe, you know, I'm willing to open, I'm keep that open. Uh, or is uh, spelling a consideration? Because sometimes it has to be and sometimes it isn't. You know, usually the rule is, you know, if I can understand what you're talking about, that's fine. But um, but sometimes you need to, have, I actually once, um, I did a category on hygiene and my first question was spell hygiene. And so um, we did that. Let's see, but uh, overall difficulty? You know, uh, again, you want something that ideally if you're doing it right, and I can't say that I've been able to accomplish this every time, but if you're doing it right, there is a category that for everybody, there is a category that somebody's going to get, you know, and that requires you to go outside your own comfort zone a decent bit and pick uh, subjects and questions that you wouldn't know the answer to. So and a number of rounds and timing. Again, I do eight rounds of seven questions. I was originally doing 10, but it went way too long. And so I, the eight rounds of seven generally takes a bit over two hours. And then question content is always one of those things that you're going to want to tweak. How much information, how many hints you give within the question versus how, does your audience want to like go, you know, are they very invested and love trivia and come over and over and over and they only want the barest amount of it? It's about kind of having these events over and over again and having discussions and conversations about what they like, what they don't like, and definitely play testing. I think one of the most valuable things I've had is uh, my student assistants are the age range I want for my uh, trivia uh, events. And so I play test with them a lot to be able to get okay, are these questions that are fun, interesting to you? Are they too hard? Have I gone too specific? Is this even a category that makes any sense? And have you like, a, does it help you uh, either either enjoy or, it's, you know, it's, it's about getting a chance to see your uh, trivia played live without having to actually do it live, which is very, very nice. Because otherwise, I've had rounds that bombed and it's like, oh, the feeling of the room has completely diminished. Yeah. And I've you know, the balloon has left all the air. So definitely try if you can play testing within the audience group that you're trying for. And then marketing it to as what one, we want to market it wide, but also we want to market what kind of event this is, what kind of trivia, because we don't want people who, if we're marketing towards maybe teens or tweens, we don't want that kind of event to be rocked up by people who are like, okay, I'm ready for trivia. This is a pub style event. It's like, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. So definitely keep that in mind when you're going at it. 
Yeah, and keep accessibility in mind. Um, again, it's nice to have a wide variety of questions um, because there are a lot of different types of learners out there. And some, you know, are more liter uh, literature based and, you know, readers who like having the words up there on the screen. Some really do well with pictures and have a better spatial memory and things like that. And, uh, you yeah, know, um, then prizes is a tricky one sometimes because that's what you'll, you know, if you're going to be spending money, you'd be spending money on that, but I don't recommend it all. So. You can give away cheap uh, certificates or something cheesy that um, uh, folks might like. You can, you know, if you want to do it as a fundraiser, I've never done this, but you could, you know, take a gate fee and then give out half. That's what a lot of pub um, trivia contests do. Maybe if you run that through the friends. Um, but, uh, you're probably better off sticking with like a cheapo trophy or a certificate, or what I do is, you know, again, I partner with a pub and they handle the prizes. I don't, you know, what they want, I don't care. <laughs> oh yeah. It, it's usually easier to just have the glory of, and, you know, kind of weird certificates. We had a, a llama trophy that we kept Stanley cup style. So we would add your name to it, but the trophy stays here until the next trivia Rama. And then you shall have the glory and we'll take pictures and put you on social media and say, you are the smartest people we know, which is essentially what we did with our RUSA event was you get to be the smartest librarians in exactly. the US. And that is coming up again at the next ALA, by the way, folks. So you'll get your chance to participate. Excellent. And next, we have a bunch of inspirational sources. So all these um, and links to uh, where you can find out more information will be added to the uh, that that resource. But in general, like inspiration can come from other people doing trivia. The global pub quiz happens once a week and is one of the most rewarding and exciting uh, virtual pubs uh, kind of experiences I've had. And I've gotten a lot of different interesting round styles from them. And so definitely take inspiration from all sources you can find. Um, stuff that I personally like, you know, we've already mentioned the ALA National Trivia Championship, but um, I, I generally like um, just going down the line in the nonfiction section. Go to your 03 ones if you're a Dewey library and pull out uh, things like, this is just pulling off my shelf just now, random illustrated facts. And 1,411 quite interesting facts to knock you sideways. Now, of course, you have to do due diligence on some of these because um, they do tend to prioritize sensationalism over accuracy sometimes. Ken Jennings wrote a book, and it was actually a very good book. And Stuff You Should Know, which is all this one just came out, and I liked it a lot. So mm -hmm. there's lots of good things to be found there. Definitely. And then we have another set of inspirational places after this. Oh, sure. And also, um, I would recommend into the games here. It was on the previous slide, too. But Learned League. Learned League is neat. Um, it is an invite only thing. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we can get folks invited if they're interested. But um, it's a really cool uh, daily contest. And uh, they have some real hard questions. I'm lucky if I get five and out of the seven in a day. So um, out of six, that is. Um, and uh, you know, there's plenty of books to be found. I always like the Uncle John's Bathroom Reader series and the Guinness Book Old Records, of course, is always fun. But, um, you know, just wandering down the st stacks a lot of the time will give you ideas. So oh, I should do something about gardening. That's a good idea. Or if I'm only in the area, oh, I should do something about, you know, um, history of Africa or, you know, there's all sorts. You, wherever you look, there will be a set of questions. Any you particularly like there, Daniel? Oh, I like using the um, board games. Actually, I have pulled many from Trivial Pursuit in a kind of potpourri round, or um, there's a game called Linky, which links four facts into a single clue word, which is fantastic. So you give them the four facts and they're like, what do these have in common? And it's, it's already done for you. That's and awesome. it's a chance to also, because all these board games are in our collection, a chance to showcase that collection and say, if you liked this round, there's an entire game uh, there for you to play at home check that out so it, it's always a lot of fun too when I can outsource the question part of it I yeah, that exactly. makes me very very happy so speaking of questions are there any we're watching your chat now yeah and twitch as well if you have any questions I will move them over and ask <laughs> 
I just think one of the things about trivia is it's it's just fun to just experiment and try. You're not going to get it perfectly right the first time, but it's not a very high bar for success. People are just going to enjoy the fact that you have an event and questions for them. Well, you are certainly welcome to add questions into the um, chat uh, either way, and we can continue on if you feel like it. What do you think, Danielle? I think we're good. No questions on either side. So definitely throughout this entire experience, add any questions that might come up, but we're going to have a trivia event for you. So we will explain each round um, in the next slide. So if you go ahead, Thomas. Oh, sure. Seven rounds, seven questions in a round. So go ahead and write down whatever that the, your, your answers are, and we'll repeat them, of course, if you need us to, but, um, and then we'll read out the correct answers and you can score yourself. So you can keep track of your score for each round, total them up after the seventh round and tell us how you did. And we trust you. We're all professionals here. Yeah. Um, you know, just let us know how you did. And uh, we will sometimes have some weird rounds that we'll need to explain to you a bit, but also be cool. and. Let's have fun. Excellent. Oh, Let's so get this into is, it. It's your so round. This is my round, huh? All right. Comic books. Ready, folks? So um, again, typed in chat like repeat if you need a repeat. But I'll leave it up for a second here. Ready. So Mickey Dugan, Star of Hogan's Alley, is one of the first ever newspaper comics. He is better known as what? Give it a second here. Round two, question two. Which current sandwich loving character in newspaper comics started out in 1930 as a rich jazz age playboy? Try to get the full name. So yeah, what's that? Um, It's a good 92 years old now. Question three, which humor magazine was launched when the comics company EC moved to the magazine format to escape comics code rules? Comics code, yeah, they were uh, quite a thing back then. They really clamped down a lot of fun stuff. Question four, what is the name of the magic animal that is Popeye's friend? And it's not the Wiffle Hen. The Wiffle Hen may have been actually the source of his powers in the comics. Comics are interesting. Question five. What is the name of the kitten that Garfield hates? Not Mondays, but the kitten. Question six. What is the name of Archie's stuck-up main rival in the comics? And presumably in Riverdale, though God knows I've never seen it. And am I moving too fast, folks? Let me know in chat if I'm moving too fast. Question seven, the name of the teleporting dog that is the pet of the Inhumans royal family. So that's it for comics. Are we ready to get some answers in? You give everybody a second to lock in. Yes. So ready. All right. Well, of course, Liz is our games and graphic novel roundtable. Beautiful friend. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's do this thing. Answers. The Yellow Kid was one of the very first newspaper comics. And uh, he's also the inspiration, by the way, for the phrase yellow journalism, because they both, Hearst and Pulitzer, fought over the character. So they actually got different artists to draw them in different papers. And so, yeah, it was a whole thing. Copyright wasn't so much of a thing back then. (laughs) Dagwood Bumstead. Yes. It's interesting to see the metamorphosis there. He got disinherited by his family after the Great Depression which is how it got stuck around because nobody wanted to read about a rich jazz age playboy after 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Mad Magazine, of course. R.I.P. <laughs> uh, question four's answer is Eugene the Jeep, 
also the source of the word Jeep. Yep. Because, Amazing. Yeah, it was neither fish nor fowl, and uh, I could go anywhere and do anything. That's, uh, I think that was the inspiration there. Nermal. Nermal what was a name. Obnoxious. And Garfield was constantly pounding him into, into the dirt. Reggie Mantle was Archie's stuck-up main rival in the comics. I don't know if that survived to Riverdale. I must check the IMDb. Uh, Reggie? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That, that one's beyond me. And then question seven, that is Lockjaw. The probably only good thing in the Inhumans, quite honestly. <laughs> well, aside from Kamala Khan, but still. So... Hope everybody did okay. Those were tricky. All right. Well, you know, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the feedback. And we will see how you do in the next category, which is 2D Ferdy, a visual round. So usually I do this round where I give out a sheet of paper and people can write on it, but we'll just have the next slide where you get to see a variety of fruit from around the world. All you have to do. Oh, yep, you can advance the next slide. All you have to do is figure out what fruit is what. So there are seven there. We're going to give you a little bit of time to kind of figure it out and feel it out. Sure, cue up Jeopardy music. Doo -doo -doo. This was one of the uh, rounds that I definitely had to uh, play test a lot because fruit is apparently one of my special interests. And so I knew a ton. And then my students were like, what is going on? <laughs> so. Well, I'm a Food Network aficionado, so looking at this unprepared, I would get one, two, three, four. I'd get six, I think. Yeah, I'd get six. They're also all delicious, so if it, you know, sparks joy, definitely go find them, although some will be harder to find in uh, than others. Some are not commercially available. And some they just turn up at the supermarket and you're just like, what's that doing here? <laughs> Although I don't think number two will. <laughs> Not our supermarkets. And that's another fun way to kind of play with the rounds is to give hints as we go along yeah. uh, to kind of spark. Um, I think maybe a couple more seconds and then we'll give it to everybody. Right. If we can get a thumbs up if everybody is feeling good about this round or if you number need a little more time. Used to grow wild up in Oregon. They were neat. Yeah, there's a couple that have very weird kind of base plant looking. Ah, oh, yes, yep. yes. Yep. Ruth uh, has mentioned when you recognize it, but don't remember what it's called. Yes. Chris is number seven. There, I think, could be any number of things. Mm -hmm. And that's another kind of visual thing. If you're doing a visual round. Um, these are all open source, um, but sometimes you might want to um, get a bigger picture so that folks can more easily identify the markers that make one fruit different from another fruit. Uh, some of them are a little tricksy, uh, I, that, and that was intentional for fun. All righty. Ready? I think, Thomas, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, yeah, friends. Yeah, I wouldn't have got Papa, and I probably wouldn't have got Mulberry. Yeah, the mulberry was tricky because I initially had it as just the fruit, but everybody's like, oh, blackberry, marionberry, every other berry. I'm like, I need to at least have the leaf back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then here's, a, and Popeye popped in there because I wanted to talk about one of our indigenous native fruits to the Americas. And University of Kentucky is actually, uh, has a Popeye project to make it more commercially available for, or at least backyard available for folks because it is a, wild kind of spanning fruit that if you were in the kind of the Appalachians would know more about. So once again, I am in the Appalachians and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, <I suck>. maybe. <laughs> uh, and we got a book in the chat for it. Thank you very much, Liz. Excellent. So that was Tutti Fruity. Well done. So let's move on to the next one. Knockoffs. Festival September, October. Yeah, I suck. I'm in, I'm in the Appalachians. I don't know crap about them. We have ginseng, wild ginseng out here. I know that. Ooh. We have black walnuts and a few other interesting things. So I would desperately love to try black walnuts sometime. We have a tree in the black backyard. They only um, are good for like a little window in October, though. Mm. 
All right, knockoffs. Let's see what you folks can do with this one. This is a straight up, you know, what's the answer to the question? Question one, which product did Oreos rip off? Because they did. They did a deep. <laughs> question two, which line of transforming toys by Tonka predated the Transformers by a year? Mm. Transformers were the knockoff. Yes, mm. <laughs> I did not know. Well, let's see about question three. Which comics character started life as a parody of Deathstroke the Terminator? A DC Comics mm -hmm. uh, villain with a lot of guns. A Fistful of Dollars is based on which Akira Kurosawa movie? <laughs> like my brain's exploding. Like, which one? Which one? Yeah, there's a few. It's, it's fun when you know half the information. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Who played the gym equivalent in the original British version of The Office? Also, which version was better? Mm, subjective. I'd say for the up until they get married, American version is better after that. <laughs> well, it was the first diet soda. Developed in 1958. It ain't the popular one now. <laughs> the hint there. And finally, N and B blocks were a Lego knockoff made in Japan by which company that went on to do bigger and better things. N and B blocks. <laughs> Are you ready for some answers now? Then, I hope everybody's gotten theirs written down. All right. Hydrox or the Oreo um, clone. Well, Oreos are the Hydrox clone anyway. <laughs> and you can still, uh, can you still find them? Or? Mm -hmm. I think you still can. They're not, it's more uh, regional than uh, mm -hmm. national, the Oreos. Well, Julie's confirming here. Thank you, Julie. And then next we have the GoBots predated the Transformers. And in fact, um, they were retroactively entered into the Transformers canon um, when um, the trans uh, Hasbro bought out their, yeah, when Hasbro bought out the GoBots IP, they retroactively put them in the canon. So, Yeah. <laughs> Deadpool is a parody of Deathstroke the Terminator. Although Rob Leafield denies it. You know, who knows with Rob Leafield. <laughs> Yo Jimbo is a parody. Is over that parody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A fistful of dollars is yeah, based on Yo Jimbo. And um, I have seen the former and not the latter, unfortunately. So. Martin Freeman, Dr. Watson himself, slash Bilbo Baggins. And then I got Dr. Watson and Bilbo Baggins, slash Baggins. <laughs> All the rules. I'm sure it already exists. So and then moving on to Diet Right. Is oh, I was so close. First diet Soda. I was thinking Pib, because my mind was like, okay, it's not going to be a popular one. It has to be something else. Yeah. I'm sure the lawsuits from the chemicals from that are still working their way through the system. And then Nintendo made N and B blocks before they went on to do video games. They made a lot of things. Look up their love hotels. It's a whole thing. <laughs> so let's see what happens with the next round. I hope everybody's got their scores all tabulated and all that. We'll keep adding numbers here as we move into 
hello my name is so this is a find for round i'm going to give you a group of people and you just need to tell me four members of that grouping sometimes it'll be a large group sometimes it'll just be a group of four uh it it varies and you only get one point you have to give me all four and you only get one point for all four i know it's unfair but such is life ready yeah let's do it so the Broadway Six reimagines the stories of the, these six real wives of Henry VIII, who are four of these famous figures. I'll give you a minute to write this one. For those of you interested um, it, in this sort of history, I recommend books by Alison Weir. They are very good. Excellent. Next. There are five original Power Rangers in both the 1993 series Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and the 2017 Power Rangers movie, who are four of that force. And you will find I like alliteration throughout this entire uh, session, so. Do you adore alliteration? I, I adore always alliteration. Ad nauseum. <laughs> <laughs> Power Rangers are after my time. I would not get that one. And this is one I had to double check because I was like, oh, which I need to be specific because there have been many, many Power Rangers series. Mm -hmm. And we'll go to the next one. All right. At the beginning of Schitt's Creek, we are introduced to four members of the Rose family. Who are the four that make up this family? Ah, I've never seen that show. Mm. <laughs> Missing out, I tell you. And also this um, round is lightly themed towards popular culture uh, kinds of figures as well. So you could easily change this to uh, literary figures or movie very specifically or TV specifically. This kind of moves around a little bit, but it's it's a fun round that uh, I've enjoyed using. It is. All right, let's move on to question number four. There are nine characters in the Lord of the Rings who set out to destroy the ring who are four of the fellowship. Now we're in my speed. <laughs> It was just there for me. I was like, oh, an F word. Yay. <laughs> uh. And I also feel really bad. If you think of bands going out and doing awesome things, Lord of the Rings pops up automatically for my mind. And then we'll go into the next question. Number five, Winnie the Pooh has seven uh, main animal friends for Christopher Robin. I should have added that part. Uh, who are the four of these friends? And those weird additions from later Disney movies. Oh yeah. It, it does pay sometimes to be like, this is the very specific piece of media I'm talking about because I, who knows what other additions exist in the universe. And then we'll go into six. The Pixar movie Inside Out personifies five emotions. What are four of those feelings? And I like questions like this because even if you've never seen the movie, you could think of emotions and you might be able to have a stab at it. It's guessable. Also, just watch the movie. It's a delight, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Pixar stand, so that makes sense. I like that. And final question for the round number seven. In The Good Place, season one, we follow four humans and their adventures in the afterlife. Who are these foolhardy four? And it's also hard sometimes when you're doing questions about how much detail do I want to give? And, you know, because somebody might want to go into that media. And The Good Place is definitely a spoiler kind of media where if you don't know it, yeah, you want to be able to experience places. it. <laughs> also why i said season one there's many many characters that you get to follow later all righty we will give you a final bit of time to tabulate all of your answers and think about your friends and fellowships and families 
and let's go. All right. So for the Broadway Six, we follow the famous figures of Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. If you said Catherine any number of times, I would have accepted it. Because I also don't know how to spell the variations of the Catherine. So in that round, I'm like, yes, if you wrote it three times, that's fine. Or just think divorced, killed, died, divorced, killed, survived. There you go. All righty, next one. And we're going with Jason, Kimberly, Billy, Trini, and Zach for our five original Power Rangers. Uh, unfortunately, there are many, many Power Rangers. So this one was a little trickier for some of my students, depending on what era they lived through. But this is the classic for me. Sometimes it's nice to have a question that just delights you as well as the giver of uh, mm -hmm. the information. And then next one. And so we have Johnny, Moira, David, and Alexis of the Rose family, which I think this was my student's favorite question because everybody else liked that piece of media as well. That's one I wouldn't have got. Mm -hmm. And then next one, we have our fellowship of Frodo, Sam, Mary, <laughs> Pippin, Gandalf, Legolas, Kimley, Boromir, and Aragon, which is fun to have the much larger groups to be able to be like, okay, there's a yeah. couple can figure out because i'm pretty sure i don't know poor bormir uh gets a lot of love i'm sure we got frodo at least in there for all of them yeah he doesn't last too long <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one if for answer number five we have kanga rue tigger eeyore oh my favorite rabbit owl and piglet not the gopher not the gopher not whatever strange amalgamations that were on disney speaking of uh lost hell? media disney had a uh live action kind of puppety version of Pooh with a lot of strange goings on but it's once again lost media there's only a little bit of clips for that one as well yeah question number six we have fear anger sadness joy and disgust for our emotions that we follow during the movie inside out which and then for final question number seven Elnor, Chidi, Jason and Tahani our beautiful foolhardy yeah. friends which there. if you haven't seen good places i recommend it highly it's very good yes excellent i hope everyone did well in this round um otherwise maybe the next run will be more your style it is two o'clock so if you folks are looking to take off because we're at the top of the hour you, you know we are not going to hold it against you but we are happy to continue on for the full few rounds here we've got a few left and so if you'd like to continue on with us we would love that Presidents, dead ones, mostly. Ready? <laughs> Name one of the two presidents that were elected under the Whig Party. <laughs> uh, there's only a couple. What and a none of them did much. But, you know, they are still got elected under the Whig Party. Question two. Who was the first president to have his photograph taken? 17 points from Liz. She has to take off. That's a shame, but uh, that's pretty darn good for four rounds. All right. Question three. Which president drank himself to death after his term ended? Well, start eliminating the assassinated ones and then... Yeah. All the alive <laughs> Question four. What is the name of James Madison's house located near that of his friend Thomas Jefferson? This feels like a trick question, Thomas. Mm. Question five. Which future president had to help clean and repair a highly radioactive melted down nuclear reactor? <laughs> then we have question six, which president died while on vacation with his mistress? Well, <laughs> once again, start president. eliminating. Yeah, well, if you're going to start eliminating ones that had mistresses, it's going to take you a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then, question seven. 
Who is the only president to not have English as his first language? We had one. So, how do you think you did? Well, let's find out. We've got answers for you. Yep, like I said, the ones who didn't do a whole lot. Died in office, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor. <laughs> The Simpsons. I can't think of the William Henry Harrison without the Simpsons. I died in 30 nights. <laughs> John Quincy Adams was the first person to have his photograph taken, and he looks mighty grumpy. But uh, he seems like kind of a grumpy sort of guy anyway. So, Franklin Pierce, but he had a good reason, quite honestly. He had kind of a, he was a crappy president first off, and, you know, he's in crappy circumstances, which he made worse. And also, there's some real sad stuff about his kids, so. And then James Madison's house, Montpellier, is near Monticello. Um, I've been to Monticello, but not Montpellier. And uh, the former is a very nice house, if you can get past all the, you know, horrible slavery stuff that kept it up. So, um, question five was uh, that Jimmy Carter, he was in the Navy and he fixed up a nuclear reactor in for pretty dangerous circumstances. <laughs> and Franklin Roosevelt died at Warm Springs, Georgia while on vacation mm -hmm. with his mistress. And Martin Van Buren spoke Dutch. First off, uh, he was born and raised up in uh, Northern uh, New York. And uh, the community there spoke Dutch. So there I you go. I can keep that one in my back pocket. That's there such a go. random factoid. Yeah. Love it. Games and sports. My, well, the first well, part's good. Second part's tough for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is like what I like to call a split round where people will be half unhappy and half happy because it is two things that generally some of us will enjoy. And some of us might not. Um, it's another fine four round. So I'm going to describe a sport and some kind of uh, category that will need a list of things. You only need to tell me four and you get one point for naming all the four. Let's start. All right. So for baseball, there are nine fielding positions. What are four of them? Mm. All right. That's a good that's a good question. That's a good mm -hmm. fair question. That is a guessability question because I know yeah. whenever a sports one comes up, it's like, oh, it's going to be statistics or it's yep. going to be nonsense. Yeah. Who won the Golden Glove in 1962 or something like that? No, nope. this is a good way to get people into <laughs> some of the sports things because it's like, okay, these aren't as difficult or minute as other ones. Yeah. And then we'll roll into question two. There are seven characters in the classic game of Clue. Name four of them. Recently. Yeah. The oh, yeah, the new one. I was about to bring that They're one up. Design. This one. Yeah, which is really great to be able to be like, you know, ah, oh, take an old classics and then get to have revamped images always makes me very, very happy. There you go. And then question three. So there are eight traditional oh. boxing divisions. What are four of them? That's a tougher one. That's, That's a little bit tougher. There's some weird ones in there where I was like, I would like to actually get a boxing book to understand where the etymology of these words came from. And then we'll roll in question number four. So there are four suits in the standard 52 deck of French suited playing cards. What are four of them? Hmm. French suited playing cards, A. Eh? Which is the general um, suit that everybody, our uh, general kind of deck that everybody plays with uh, nowadays, but had to be specific because we've had many different types of playing cards and many variations of suits and uh, numbers and all those good things. So specificity is sometimes important because I was like, oh, I know it. Somebody's going to be pedantic with this question. Be yeah. very careful. And then question number five. For sports climbing, there are four disciplines awards given for the IFSC, International Federation of Sports Climbing, World Championship. What are four of them? This is my beautiful personal interest. And I'm very excited because sports climbing has just been added to the Olympics. Really? And it has. Last Olympics was the first time that sports climbing was ever added, and it had one award and one gold, which will change later, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we go into answers, because I don't want to give anything away. Hmm. All right. 
Eh. Question number six. In the original 1996 version of the game Catan, there are five types of resources produced. What are four of them? There actually have a lot of different variations of Catan. There's Star Trek Catan. There's um, Catan um, additions as well that add more variants and exciting things. So just want the very original for this one. And then question number seven. There are eight field events in the Olympics. So this is field specifically, if you think track and field, just the field events, what are four of them? Mm. You think about the modern de decathlon, some of them might be in there. And we will roll into answers. All just right. let us know if you want to slow down or need anything asked. Nope, good deal. So. We have pitcher, catcher, first, second, third base, which should be the easy parts of that question, mm -hmm. and shortstop, left field, center field, and right field. So a fair chance that you will get some of these in your own. All righty, answer number, or question number two, answer number two. So we have Professor Plum, Mrs. White, Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, Mr. Green, Mrs. Peacock, and Mr. Body. Mr. Body. Poor Mr. Body. Always forget about him. All right, the answer number three. So we have flyweight, bantamweight, featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight. Hmm. I want to know where bantam. I because bantam, I, I can tell you. I don't know welter. Oh, there you bantam's go. from uh, cockfighting, unfortunately. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. And then to four, we have spade, club, diamond, and heart. Tiny bit tricky because I said. Things that are technically true, but you're like, why? What is the French student? What does that mean? Yeah, throws you off. Yeah. Right. And then answer number uh, to question four or five. There we go. So we have lead, boulder, speed, and combined. In the Olympics last year or the last Summer Olympics, we had a combined only uh, gold medal. We will now be splitting um, the lead on uh, boulder to one medal and speed into its own medal. So that way, speed climbers who are entirely different body type will have a chance uh, versus lead and boulder who have a very similar kind of style of climbing as well. So it makes sense to split them up a little bit, but it would be best if they had all four in the Olympics one day. Cool. And then for Catan, you have lumber, wool, grain, brick, and ore, which you may trade around and enjoy that while you're playing. Good and question. answer number seven. So of the fielding events, there is pole vault, high jump, long jump, triple jump, which I didn't actually know about, uh, shot put, discus, hammer throw, and javelin. I like the throwing sports. Those are my favorites. I did pole vault back in the day. Ah, I wasn't as good at Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The last round then is last film. Round. So let's see what we can do for film today. Oop, ah, I'm skipping. No, stop. Back up, back up. Ah, there we go. Question one. Who directed Eraserhead? It's an incredibly weird movie by an incredibly weird person. Did anybody see Eraserhead? Let's see. Question two. What movie was shown for the first episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000? The best show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That helps. That helps. That's a good hit. Mm. Moving on then. Georges Méliès, I can't pronounce French, I hope that's right, is most famous for which movie? Did anybody read the book Hugo? Mm. Because if so, that might help. Question four, which musician played Needles, Marty's future co-worker in Back to the Future 2? And Back to the Future 2. Question five. Which movie is most famous for having a long-haired Sean Connery in a mankini and thigh-high boots? <laughs> Imagery that still resonates to this day. <laughs> Gotta have a classic. Question six. 
Who directed, directed Fritz the Cat based on the R. Crumb comic? Animated movie. Directed by a guy who's real good at directing, so let's say, older skewing animated movies. <laughs> and finally, question seven, which comedy trio from the 1930s was made up of the brothers Harry, Jimmy, and Al? I don't mind saying this is a tougher one. Are you ready for some answers? <clears throat> Let's see them. David Lynch did Eraserhead. One of his probably bigger ones, quite honestly, before Twin Peaks. And then over here, we have The Crawling Eye. So I love that show so much. <laughs> then we have question three, which is Voyage to the Moon, with the uh, famous for having the big old bullet in the moon's eyeball, which it shows up a lot. Question four, Flea. Flea, and also, Flea was also in Big Lebowski, of course, as one of the nihilists. Zardos was the answer to question five, which was a weird, weird move. Oh my goodness, that was a thing. Question six, Ralph Bakshi, who did a whole lot of stuff, including Cool World <laughs> and the Lord of the Rings animated adaptation which from what I understand nearly drove them nuts. And then question seven was the Ritz brothers, which aren't very well known nowadays. That one's a tougher one. Everybody knows the Marx brothers, everybody knows the Stooges, but the Ritz brothers, eh, not so much. So, and that is the end of that. So, Do we have any questions? Or does anybody want to share their scores? Yeah, please share your scores. We would love to know. Final score of Stitch Witch Kitnits of 22. Okay. Uh, they had a great time, which yeah, is right. all that we can hope for, always. 19, all right. 22, we are, everybody's in good company. When everybody starts having about the same scores, I feel pretty good. Yeah. It was pretty well balanced. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and joining us for this session. I have linked once more the resources for today's session. If you have any questions at all, please contact us. Email is in there. But we're very excited and hope to see you on the, what is it? I want to double check the date, the tip uh, for our low stress, high mayhem uh, TTRPs at G session of, um, I don't quite know what we're playing. It might be a sequel. It might be a new one. So keep a uh, track and join us on Twitch for that if you want to uh, see. Uh, otherwise, my name is Danielle Costello. Thomas Vos. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have trivia with you today. Take care, everyone. Have Thank a good you day. Thank you very much.